This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran, Chapter 16 The Fingers in the Pie. Strange how women folks get discouraged right on their job among their best friends who would do anything in the world for them, except just to see that a little bit of change would help them. Mickey When Mickey went to the kitchen the next morning to bring water for the inevitable washing, Mrs. Harding said to him, Is it possible that child is awake this early? No, she is sleeping like she'd never come to, said Mickey. I'll wait till the last minute before I touch her. You shouldn't wake her, said Mrs. Harding. But I must, said Mickey. I can't go away and leave her not washed, fed, and fixed the best I can. Of course, I understand that, said Mrs. Harding, but now it's different. Then you were forced. This is merely a question of what is best for her. Now, Mickey, we're all worked up over this till we're most beside ourselves, and we want to help. Suppose you humor us by letting us please ourselves a trifle. How does that proposition strike you? Square from the ground up, answered Mickey promptly, but what would please you? Well, said Mrs. Harding, it would please me to keep this house quiet and let that child sleep till the demands of her satisfied body wake her up. Then I'd love to bathe her as a woman would her own, in like case, and cook her such dainties as she should have, things with lots of lime in them. I think her bones haven't been built right. I believe I could make her fifty percent better in three months myself, and as far as taking her away when this week is up, you might as well begin to make a different plans right now. If she does well here and likes it, she can't be taken back where I found her till cool weather, if I can consent of my mind to let her go then. Of course I know she's yours, and things will be as you say, but think a while before you go against me. If I do all I can for her, I ought to earn the privilege of having my finger in the pie a little bit. So far as Lily goes, said Mickey, I'd be tickled most to death. I ain't anxious to pull and haul and wake up the poor little sleepy thing. Every morning it most makes me sick. I'd a lot rather let her sleep it out, as you say. But while Lily is mine, and I've got to do the best by her I can, you are Peter's, and he must do the best by you he can. And did you notice how he jumped on that washing business yesterday? How are we going to square up with Peter? I am perfectly willing to do what I said for the sake of that child who never has had the usual chance of a dog till you found her. I've come to be mighty fond of you, Mickey, in the little time I've known you. If I didn't like and want to help Peaches, I'd do a lot for her just to please you. Gee, you're something grand, cried Mickey. Just common clay, commonest kind of clay, Mickey, said Mrs. Harding. But if you want to know how you could square it with me, which will square it with Peter, I'll tell you. You may think I'm silly, but as we're made, we're made. And this is how it is with me. Of course, I love Peter, my children, my home, and I love my work. But I've had this job without jot or tittle of change for fifteen years, and I'm about stalled with the sameness of it. I know you'll think I'm crazy. I won't, interrupted Mickey. You go on and tell me. The sameness of it is getting you and... Just the way you flew around and did things last night perfectly amazed me. I never saw a boy like you before. You helped me better and with more sense than any woman I ever hired. And thinking it over last night, I said to myself, Now, if Mickey would be willing to trade jobs with me, it would give me a change and it wouldn't be any more woman's work for him than what he is doing. Now never you mind about the woman's work part of it, said Mickey. That doesn't cut any ice with me. It's men's work to eat, and I don't know who made a law that it's any more woman's work to cook for men than it is their own. If there is a law of that kind, I bet a liberty bird the men made it. I hadn't had my show at lawmaking yet, but when I get it, there are some things I can see right now that I'm going to fix for Lily, and I'd sooner fix them for you too than not. Just what were you thinking? Mrs. Harding went to Mickey, took him by the shoulder, turned him toward the back door, and piloted him to the porch, 
where she pointed east, indicating an open line. It began as high as his head against the side of the harding back wall and ran straight. It crossed the yard between trees that, through no design at all, happened to stand in line with those of the orchard, so that they formed a narrow emerald wall on each side of a green carpeted space that led to the meadow where it widened, ran downhill, and crossed lush grass where cattle grazed. Then it climbed a far hill, tree-crested, cloud-capped. And in a midst of glory the faint red of the rising sun worked color miracles with the edges of cloud-rims, tinted them with flushes of rose, lavender, streaks of vivid red, and a broad stripe of pale green. Alone on the brow of the hill stood one giant old apple tree, the remains of an early day orchard. It was wide branching, symmetrically outlined, backed and colored by cloud wonder above and around it. The woman pointed down the avenue with a shaking finger and asked, See that, Mickey? Start slow and get all of it. Every time I've stepped on this back porch for fifteen years, summer or winter, I've seen that just as it is now or as it was three weeks ago when the world was blooming, or as it will be in the red and gold of fall, or the later grays and browns, and when it's ice-coated, and the sun comes up, I think sometimes it will kill me. I've neglected my work to stand staring many's the time in summer, and I've taken more than one chill in winter. I've tried to show Peter, and a few times I've suggested, and watch sun up pretty soon. Things are going to be wrong at this house. He ought to have seen for himself that you should have had a window cut there the first thing, said Mickey. Well, he didn't, and he doesn't, said Mrs. Harding. But, Mickey, for fifteen years there hasn't been a single morning of my life when I went to the back porch for water. And you ought to have had water inside fifteen years ago, cried Mickey. Why, so I had, exclaimed Mrs. Harding. And come to think of it, I've mentioned that to Peter over and over, too. But, Mickey, what I started to say was that I've been perfectly possessed to follow that path and watch the sun rising while sitting under that apple tree, and never yet have I got to the place where there wasn't bread or churning or a baby or visitors or washing or ironing or some reason why I couldn't go. Maybe I'm a fool, but sure as you're a foot high, I've got to take that trip pretty soon now, or my family is going to see trouble. And last night, thinking it over for the thousandth time, I said to myself, Since he's so handy, if he'd keep things going just one morning, just one morning, Mickey handed her a sun hat. Go on, he said gruffly, I'll do your work, and I'll do it right, and Lily can have her sleep. Go on. The woman hesitated a second, pushed away the hat, took her bearings and crossed the walk, heading directly toward the old apple tree on the far crest. Her eyes were set on the rising sun, and as she turned to close the yard gate, Mickey could see that there was an odd, unnatural expression on her face. He rolled his sleeves and stepped into the dining room. By the time Peter and Junior came with big buckets of milk, Mickey had the cream separator rinsed and together as he had helped Mrs. Harding fix it the day before. With his first glance, Peter inquired, "'Where's Ma?' "'She's doing something she's been crazy to do for fifteen years,' answered Mickey calmly, as he set the gauge and poured in the first bucket of milk. "'Which ain't answering where she is. "'So taint,' said Mickey, starting the machine. "'Well, if you'll line up, I'll show you. "'Train your peepers down that green subway and out to glory as presented by the Almighty in this particular stretch of country. "'And just beyond your cows, there you'll see a spot about as big as Bobby, and that will be your nice lady heading straight for sunrise. She said she wanted to go for fifteen years, and there's always had been churning or baking or something, so this morning, as there wasn't a thing but what I could do as good as she could, why, she made it up that I'd finish her work and let her see her sunrise, since she seems to be set on it, and when she gets back she's going to wash and dress Lily for a change. Strange how women folks get discouraged on their job among their best friends, who would do anything in the world for them, except just to see that a little bit of change would help them. It will be a dandy scheme for Lily, cause it lets her get her sleep out. And it will be good for you, cause if Mrs. Harding doesn't get to sit under that apple tree, 
and watch sun up pretty soon. Things are going to go wrong at this house. Peter's lower jaw slowly sagged. If you don't hurry, said Mickey, even loving her like you do and loving you as she does, she's going to have them nervous prostrations like the swell dames in Multiopolis get when they ask a fellow to carry a package and can't remember where they want to send it. She's not there yet. She's ahead of them now, for she wants to sit under that apple tree and watch sun up. But if she hadn't got there this morning or soon now, she'd have begun to get mixed. I could see that plain as the city hall. Mickey, what else can you see? asked Peter. Enough to make your head swim, said Mickey. Out with it, ordered Peter. Well, said Mickey gravely, and seemingly intent on the separator, but covertly watching Peter. Well, if you'd a cut that window she'd wanted for fifteen years, right over her table there where the line comes, she could have been seeing that particular bit of glory. You notice, Peter, that probably there's nothing niftier on earth than just the little spot she's been pining for. Look good yourself, and you'll see that she's just climbing the hill to the apple tree. Look at it carefully, and then step inside and focus on what she's been faced with instead. What else does she want? inquired Peter. She didn't mention anything but to watch sun up just once under that apple tree, said Mickey. I don't know what she wants, but from one day here I could tell you the things she should have. Well, go ahead and tell, said Peter. Will you agree not to break my neck till I get this cream in the can and what she keeps strained and these buckets washed, asked Mickey. I want to have her job all done when she gets back, cause I promised her, and that's quite a hike she's taken. Well, I was riled for a minute, but I might as well hold myself, said Peter. Looks like you were right. Strangers coming in can always see things that folks on the job can't, consoled Mickey. Well, go on and tell me what you've seen here, Mickey. Mickey hoisted the fourth bucket. Well, I've seen the very nicest lady I ever saw, excepting my mother, said Mickey. I've seen a man bout your size that I like better than any man I know, barring Mr. Douglas Bruce. And the bar is such a little one it would take a microscope to find it. Peter laughed, which was what Mickey hoped he would do, for he drew a deep breath and went on with greater assurance. I've seen a place that I thought was a new edition of heaven, and it is, only it needs a few modern improvements. Yes, Mickey, the window, and what else? You haven't looked at what I told you to about the window yet, said Mickey. Well, since you insist on it, I will, said Peter. And while you're in there, suggested Mickey, after you finish with that strip of brown oil cloth and the pans and skillets adorning it, cotton up to that cook stove and imagine standing over it while it is roaring to get three meals a day and all the baking and fruit canning and boiling clothes and such, and tell me if Lily's bed was in so much hotter a place than your wife is, all but about three hours each day. Mickey, listening as intently as he could for the separator, he dared not stop heard not a sound for what seemed a long time, and then came amazing ones. He grinned sympathetically as Peter emerged red-faced and raging. "'And you're about the finest man I ever met, too,' commented Mickey, still busy with the cream. "'You can see what a comfort this separator must be, but it's the only thing your nice lady has got against so many for your work it takes quite a large building to keep them in. Junior was showing me last night and telling me what all those machines were for.' You know, Peter, if there was money for a hay rake and a manure spreader and a wheel plow and a disc and a reaper and a mower and a corn planter and a corn cutter and a cider press and a windmill and a silo and an automobile, you know, Peter, there should have been enough for that window and the pump inside and a kitchen sink and a bread mixer and a dishwasher, and if there wasn't any other single thing, there ought to be some way you sell the wood and use the money for the kind of a summer stove that's only hot under what you're cooking, and turns off the flame the minute you finish. Honest, there had, Peter. I got a little gasoline one in my room that's better than what your nice lady has. The things she should have would cost something, cost a lot for all I know, but I bet what she needs wouldn't take half the things in the building Junior showed me did, and it couldn't be the start of what a sick wife and a doctor bills and strange women coming and going and abusing you and the children would cost. Shut up, cried Peter. That will do. Now you listen to me, young man, since you are so expert at seeing things, and since you've traded work with my wife to rest her by changing her job. 
Suppose you just keep your eyes open and make out a list of what she should have to do her work convenient and easy as can be, and of course comfortably. That stove's hot yet, and breakfast's been over an hour too. Nothing like it must be going full blast and things steaming and frying. Sure, said Mickey. Watch a few days and then we'll talk it over. If it is your train time, ride down with Junior and I'll stay in the house till she comes. I guess little white butterfly won't wake up. And if she does, she'll be all right with me. Mary dresses herself and Bobby. Is Mary helping her ma right? Well, some, said Mickey, not all she could. But her taking care of Bobby is a big thing. Junior could do a lot of things, but he doesn't seem to see them, and— And so could I, asked Peter. Is that the ticket? Yes, said Mickey. All right, young man, said Peter, fix us over. We are ready for anything that will benefit Ma. She's the pinwheel of this place. Now you scoot. I can see her coming. It's our secret, then? asked Mickey. Yes, it's our secret, answered Peter gravely. Mickey took one long look at Peaches and went running to the milk wagon. Junior offered to let him drive, so for the first time he took the lines and guided a horse. He was a happy boy as he spun on his heel, waiting a few minutes for the trolley. He sat in the car with no paper in which to search for headlines, no anxiety as to whether he could dispose of enough to keep Peaches from hunger that night, sure of her safety and comfort. The future, colored by what Mrs. Harding had said to him, took on such a rosy glow it almost hurt his mental eyes. He reveled in greater freedom from care than he had ever known. He sat straighter and curiously watched the people in the car. When they entered the city and the car swung down his street near the business center, Mickey stepped off and, hiding himself, watched for the passing of the boy on his old route. Before long it came. I like to sell papers in such good imitation of his tone and call that Mickey's face grew grave, and a half-jealous little ache began in his heart. Course we're better off, he softly commented. Of course I can't go back now, and I wouldn't if I could. But it makes me want to swat any fellow using my call and taking my men. Gee, the kid is doing better than I thought he could. Believe he's got the idea all right. I'll just join the procession. Mickey stepped into line and following, pausing whenever a paper was sold, until he was sure that his men were patronizing his substitute. Then he overtook him. Good work, kid, he applauded been following you and you're doing well let me take a paper a second yes i thought so you're leaving out the biggest scoop on the sheet here give them a laugh on this chasing wrinkles how did you come to slide over it and not bump enough to wake you up get on this sublime males seeking beauty doctors to renew youth how would you cry it asked the boy ah looky looky mickey shouted holding his side with one hand and waving a paper with the other all the old boys hiking to the beauty parlors, pinking up the glow of youth to beat Billy Burke. Corner on icicles, Billy gets left, cause the boys are using all of them. Oh my, will a time, oiled with cold cream and reversed with an icicle. Morning paper, tells you how to put the cream on your face instead of in the coffee. Stick your head in the ice box at sixty and come out sixteen. Ah, get in line, gentlemen, don't block traffic. When the policemen scattered the crowd, Mickey's substitute had not a paper remaining, and with his pocket full of change he was running to the nearest stand for a fresh supply. Mickey went with him and watched with a critical eye why the boy tried a reproduction of what he called a daily scream. The first time it was rather flat. "'You ain't going at it right,' explained Mickey. "'Fore you can make anybody laugh on this job, you must see the fun of life yourself.' Beauty parlors have always been for the swell dames and the theater ladies who pink up while their gents hump to pay the bill. You ought always take one paper home and read it so you know what's going on in the world. Now from what I've read I know that the getaway of the beauty parlor is cold cream, and one of the show ladies the boys are always wild over told the papers long ago about how she used icicles on her face to pink it up. Now if you'd have known this like you should, the minute you clapped your peepers on that chasing wrinkles, you'd a knowed where your laugh came in today. Like I've told you over and over, you must get it. Bet Chuffner put that there on purpose for me, which same gives me an idea. You've been called the Hawko Geezer War and the lightweight champion of Mexico, 
and the psychological panic something fine but did you sell out on them not on your top knot you lost your load on the scream get the joke of life soaked in your system good on this you make yourself see the plutes the magnates the city officials leaving their jobs and hiking to the beauty parlors to beat the dames at their daily stunt of being creamed and icicled and it's funny when it's so funny to you that you just howl about it why it's catching didn't you see me catch them with it now go on and do it again and get the scream in the boy began to cry with tears of laughter in his eyes he kept it up as he handed out papers and took in change satisfied minky called to him tell your sire it's all over but polishing the silver he started down the street glancing at clocks he was passing with nimble feet threading the crowd until he reached the herald office there he dodged in and making his way to the editorial desk he waited his chance when he saw an instant of pause in the work of the busy men he started his cry morning papers i like to sell them and so on to the chasing wrinkles there because he was excited for he knew that his reception would depend on how good a laugh he gave them mickey outdid himself reporters waiting assignments crowded around him mr chuffner beckoned and mickey stepped to him found it all right did you young man the scream lifted the load cried mickey war and waste and wickedness didn't get a look in i thought you'd like that laughed the editor biggest scoop yet said mickey why it took the police to scatter the crowd they struggled to get papers till they looked like the bird on the coin they were passing in trying to escape the awful things it goes through on the money and get back to nature where perfectly good birds belong honest they did have you any poetry for me yet no but i'm headed that way answered mickey how so inquired the editor well why i got another kid so he can do my stunt till nobody knows the difference and i've gone into mr bruce's office and we're after the grafters douglas bruce queried mr chuffner yes said mickey he's my boss and say he's the finest man you ever met and his joy lady is nice as he is and prettier than moonshine on the park lake i never saw a lady who could hold a candle to miss leslie winton and they just love to tell folks they're engaged suddenly the editor arose from his chair gripped his desk leaned across it toward mickey and almost kicked him from his feet with one word what mickey staggered and stared at last he recovered his breath mr bruce and miss leslie don't care if i tell it he defended they all the time tell it what why that they're going to be married soon as mr bruce gets the grafter he's who's robbing the taxpayers of multiopolis and collects his big fee that's what as suddenly as he had arisen, Mr. Chuffner dropped back and in a stupefied way still looked at Mickey. And in equal days, Mickey watched him. Then, you come with me, Mr. Chuffner said, rising as he entered a small room and closed the door. Now you tell me all about this engagement. Maybe they don't want it in the papers yet, said Mickey. I guess I'll let Mr. Bruce do his own talking. But you said they told everybody. So they do, said Mickey and of course they'd tell you you can call him his number is five hundred x the editor made a note of it and studied mickey yes that would be a better way of course he agreed you have a long head young man and so you think miss leslie winton is a fine young lady surest thing you know said mickey why let me tell you and then in a few swift words with broad strokes Mickey sketched in the young woman so intelligent she had selected him from all the other newsies by a description and sent him to Mr. Bruce, how she had dolls ready to give away and poor children might ride in her car, how she lived with darling old daddy, and there Mickey grew enthusiastic and told of the rest house, and then the renting of the cabin on Atwater by the most beautiful and considerate of daughters, for her father and her lover and when he could not think of another commendatory word to say mickey paused while a dazed man muttered a word so low this boy scarcely heard it i don't know why you say that cried mickey oomph said mr chuffner slowly i don't either only i didn't understand they were engaged it's my business to find and distribute news and gets it fresh scoop it as our term is and so mickey 
when investigations are going on and everybody knows a de now a big surprise is coming in order to make sure that my paper gets in on the ground floor i make some investigation for myself and sometimes by accident sometimes by intuition sometimes by sharp deduction we happen to land before the investigators of course we have personal financial and political reasons for not spoiling the game now we haven't gone into the city hall investigation as bruce has and we can't show figures but we know enough to understand where he's coming out so when the gig upsets we have our side ready and will embroider his figures with what the public is entitled to in the way of news sure but i don't see why you act so funny oh it's barely possible that i've got ahead of your boss on a few features of his investigation ah said mickey well i hope you ain't gonna rush in and spoil his scoop you see he doesn't know who he's after himself we talk about it a lot of times i tell him how i've sold papers and seen men like he's chasing get their dose and go sick and white and can't e ever face men straight again but he says stealing is stealing and cut where it will those who rob the taxpayers must be exposed i told him maybe he'd be surprised and maybe he'd be sorry but he says it's got to be stopped no matter who gets hurt well he's got his nerve cried the editor yes agreed mickey he's so fine himself he thinks no other men worth saving could go wrong i told him i wish the men he was after would break their necks fore he gets them but he goes right on mickey you figure closer than your boss does in one way i do conceded mickey it's like this he knows books and men and how things should be but i know how they are see i certainly see said the intent listener mickey when it comes to the place where you think you know better than your boss well it's bad news for me to tell you keep your eyes open and maybe you can save him books and theories are all right but there are times when a man comes a cropper on them you watch and if you think he's riding for a fall you come skimming and tell me not over the phone come and tell me here take this it will get you to me any time no matter where i am or what i'm doing understand you think mr bruce is going to get into trouble his job is to get other people into trouble but he says he ain't got a thing to do with it said mickey he says they get themselves into trouble that's so too commented mr chuffner anyway keep your mouth tight shut and your eyes wide open and if you think your boss is getting into deep water you come and tell me i want things to go right with you because i'm depending on that poem for my front page soon mickey held out his hand sure he agreed i'm in an awful good place now to work up the poetry piece being right out among the cows and clover and about mr bruce gee i wish he was a plowin' corn i just hate his job he's doin' now sure if i see rocks i'll make a run for you thanks boss mickey had lost time and he hurried for things seemed to be happening for as he left the elevator and sped down the hall he ran into mr james minturn with a hasty glance he drew back and darted for the office door mr minturn's face turned a dull red one minute young man he called i'm late said mickey shortly i must hurry bruce is late too i just came from his office and he isn't there answered mr minturn well i want to get it in order before he comes in fact you want anything but to have a word to say to me hazarded mr minturn well then since you're such a good guesser i ain't just crazy about you said mickey shortly and i'm tired of having you run for me as if i were afflicted with smallpox said mr minturn if your blood is right smallpox ain't much said mickey i haven't a picture of myself running from that if it really wanted a word with me but you have a picture of yourself running for me maybe i do conceded mickey i've noticed it on occasions so frequent and conspicuous that others no doubt will do the same said mr minturn if you are all bruce thinks you then you should give a man credit for what he tries to do you surprised me too deeply for words with the story you brought me one day i knew most of your facts from experience better than you did except the one horrible thing that shocked me speechless but mickey when i had time to adjust myself 
I made the investigations you suggested and proved what you said. I deserve your scorn for not acting faster. But what I had to do couldn't be done in a day. For the boy's sake it had to be done as privately as possible. There's no longer any reason why you should regard me as a monster. I'm awful glad you told me, Mickey said. I surely did have you sized up something scandalous. And yet I couldn't quite make out how, if my view was right, Mr. Bruce and Miss Leslie would think so much of you. They are friends I am proud to have, said Mr. Minturn, and I hope you'll consider being a friend to me and to my boys also. If ever a time comes when I can do anything for you, let me know. Now right on that point, pause a moment, said Mickey. You are a friend to my boss? I certainly am, and I'm under deep obligations to Miss Winton. If ever my home becomes once more what it was to start with, it will be her work. Could a man bear heavier obligation than that? Well, hardly, said Mickey. Of course, there wouldn't likely ever be anything you could do for Miss Leslie that would square that deal. But I'm worried about my boss something awful. Why, Mickey? asked Mr. Minturn. That investigation you started him on. I did start him on that. What's the matter? Well, the returns are about all in, said Mickey, and the man who draws the candy suit is about ready to put it on, see? Good, exactly what he should do. Yes, exactly, agreed Mickey dryly, but who do you figure it is? We got some good friends in the city hall. Always is somebody you don't expect, said Mr. Minturn. Don't waste any sympathy on them, Mickey. Not unless in some way my boss gets himself into trouble, said Mickey. There's no possible way he could. About the smartest man in Multiopolis thinks yes, said Mickey. I'd just been talking with him. Who, Mickey? asked Mr. Minturn instantly. Chuffner of the Herald, said Mickey. What? Mr. Minturn seized the boy's arm, shoved him inside his door, and closed it. Mickey pulled away and turned a belligerent face upward. Now Nick's on knocking me down with your what's, he cried. I just been hammered mellow with his, and dragged into his room and shut up and scared stiff about twenty minutes ago. The devil you say, exploded Mr. Minturn. No, I said Chuffner, insisted Mickey. Chuffner of the Herald. I'm going to write a poetry piece for his front page some day soon now. I've been selling his paper all my life. And so you're a friend of Chuffner's? Oh, not bosom and inseparable, explained Mickey. I haven't seen so awful much of him, but when I do, we get along fine. And he said, questioned Mr. Minturn. Just what I've been afraid of all the time, said Mickey, that these investigations at times goes into places you didn't look for, and made awful trouble, and that my boss might get it with his. Mickey, you will promise me something? asked Mr. Minturn. You see, I started Mr. Bruce on this trying to help him to a case that would bring him into prominence. So if it should go wrong, it's in a way through me. If you think Douglas is unlike himself or worried, will you tell me? Will you? Why, surest thing you know, cried Mickey. Why, I should say I would. Gee, you're great, too. I think I'll like you awful well when we get acquainted. Mickey was busy when Bruce entered, and with him was Leslie Winton. They brought the breath of spring mellowing into summer, freighted with emanations of real love, touched and tinctured with joy, so habitual it had been spontaneous on the part of Leslie Winton, and this morning contagious with Douglas Bruce. Mickey stood silent, watched them closely, and listened. So in three minutes, from ragged scraps and ejaculations effervescing from what was running over in their brains, he knew that they had taken an early morning plunge into Atwater, landed a black bass, had a breakfast of their own making, at least in so far as gathering wild red raspberries from the sand pit near the bridge, and then they had raced to the Multiopolis station to start Mr. Winton on a trip west to try to sell his interest in some large land holdings there, the care of which he was finding burdensome. Heavens, how I hope Daddy makes that sale, cried Leslie. I've been so worried about him this summer. I wondered at your not going with him, said Douglas. He didn't want me, said Leslie. He said it was a flying trip, and he was forced to be back before some reports from his office were filed, and he wouldn't have a minute to rest or, or travel as we do, so he thought I wouldn't enjoy it, 
and for the first time in my life he told me distinctly that he didn't have time for me. Fancy, Daddy, I can't understand it. I've noticed that he has been brooding and preoccupied of late, not at all like himself, said Douglas. Have you any idea what troubles him? Of course, he told me, said Leslie. It's Mr. Swain. When Daddy was a boy, Mr. Swain was his father's best friend, and when Grandfather died, he asked him to guide Daddy. And he not only did that, but he opened his purse and started him in business. Now Mr. Swain is growing old, and some of his investments have gone wrong. Just when political changes made business close as could be, he lost heavily, and then came the war. There was no way but for Daddy to stay here and fight to save what he could for him. He told me early last fall. We talked of it again in the winter, and this spring, most of all, I've told you. Yes, I know. I wish I could help," said Douglas. "I do too. I wish it intensely," said Leslie. When father comes, we'll ask him. We're young and strong, and we should stand by. I never saw Daddy in such a state. He must sell that land. He said so. He said last night he'd be forced to sell if he only got half its value, and that wouldn't be enough. Enough for what? Asked Douglas. To help Mr. Swain," said Leslie. He's going to use his fortune," queried Douglas. "I don't know that Daddy has holdings large enough to deserve the word," said Leslie. "He's going to use what he has. I urged him to. It's all he can do." "Did you take into consideration that it may end in his failure?" asked Douglas. "I did," said Leslie, "and I forgot to tell him, but I will as soon as he comes back. He can have all Mother left me too if he needs it." Leslie, you're a darling, but have you ever eaten a small taste of poverty? Asked Douglas. No, but I've always been curious if I did have, to see if I couldn't so manage whatever might be my share, that it would appear to the world without that peculiar state of grime which always seems to distinguish it. Said the girl. I'm not afraid of poverty, and I'm not afraid of work. It's dishonor that would kill me. Daddy accepted obligations if they involve him, which includes me also. Then to the last cent we possess, we pay back. Mickey drew the duster he handled between vacuum days across the table, and steadily watched first Douglas, then Leslie, both of whom had forgotten him. That should be good enough for Daddy. What about me? Asked Douglas. If ever I get in a close place, does the same hold good? If I know what you are doing, surely. I knew you were a bearer of mourning first time I saw you," said Douglas. But we are forgetting Mickey. Mickey promptly stepped forward, putting away the duster to be ready for errands. How are you this morning? Asked Douglas. Fine, answered Mickey. I've taken my family to the country too. Why, Mickey? Without saying a word, cried Douglas. Well, it happened so fast, said Mickey, and I didn't want to bother you when your head was so full of your old investigation and your own moving. Did you hear that, Leslie? He asked. Mickey dislikes my investigation as much as the man who comes out short is going to any day now. So you've moved Peaches to the country. You should have told me first. I'm sorry if you don't like it," said Mickey. "You see, my room was getting awful hot. I never was there days this time of year, and nights I slept on the fire escape. All right for me, but it wouldn't do for Lily. Why should I have told you? Because Miss Winton had plans for her," explained Douglas. She intended to take her to Atwater, and she even contemplating having her back examined for you. Mickey's eyes danced, and over his face spread a slow grin of comprehension. Well, ejaculated Douglas. Nothing, said Mickey. Well, demanded Douglas. Mickey laughed outright. Then he sobered suddenly and spoke gravely, directly to Miss Winton. Thank you for thinking of it and planning for her," he said. "I was afraid you would." Thank me for something you feared I would do, Mickey. Aren't you getting things mixed? Thank you for thinking of Lily and wanting to help her," explained Mickey. "But she doesn't need you. She's mine, and I'm going to keep her. And what I can do for her will have to be enough until I can do better." I see," said Leslie. "But suppose that she should have attention at once that you can't give her, and I can. Then I'd be forced to let you, even if it took her from me," agreed Mickey. But thank the Lord, things ain't that way. I didn't take my say so for it. I went to the head nurse for the Star of Hope, 
She's gone to the new Elizabeth home now. She loves to nurse children best. All the time from the first day she's told me how and showed me. So Lily has been taken care of right. You needn't worry about that. And where she is now, if she was a queen lady, she couldn't have had a grander. Honest she couldn't. But, Mickey, how are you going to pay for all that? queried Douglas. Easy as falling off a car in a narrow skirt, said Mickey. Remember that big house where things are heaven white, and a yard full of trees, and the fence corners are cut with the shears, and the street, I mean the road, swept with a broom, this side of the golf grounds about two miles? Yes, said Douglas. The woman there halted my car one evening and spoke to me about you. Oh, she did? exclaimed Nicky. Well, I hope you gave me a good send off, cause she's a lady I'm most particular about. You see, I stopped there for a drink the day you figured instead of playing, and she told me about a boy who was to be sent out by the Herald and hadn't come. And as she was ready and interested, she was disappointed. So I just said to her if the boy didn't come, how she'd like to have a nice good little girl that wouldn't ever be the least bother. Next day she came to see us and got on her knees just like you did. And away Lily went sailing to the country in a big automobile. And she isn't coming back till my rooms are cool, if she can be spared then. But how are you going to pay, Mickey? Most people only take children for a week. Yes, I know, said Mickey. But these folks haven't ever tried it before, and they don't know the ropes. So we're doing it our own way, and it's worked something grand. If they are suited, said Douglas. She seemed a good woman, and that place is far better than where we feel so comfortable. We started this morning, said Mickey. The lady and I traded jobs. She sat on a hill under an apple tree and watched sunrise. I washed the dishes, separated the cream, and scrubbed the porch for her. When Lily wakes up, the lady is going to bathe and rub and feed her, and see to her like she owned her to pay me back. It's a bargain. You couldn't beat it, could you? Of course, if you want to turn yourself into a housemaid, said Douglas irritably. Mickey laughed, and Leslie sent a slightly frowning glance toward Douglas. You can search me, cried the boy, throwing out his hands in his familiar's gesture. Why, I just love to. I always helped mother. Pay? I'll pay, all right. The nice lady will say I do, and so will Peter. It's my most important job to make her glad of me as I am of her. And if you put it up to me, I'd a lot rather have my job than yours. And I bet I can get more joy from it for my family. Croker laughed Bruce. Tain't good to be a scream for the fellow who comes short. So you're planning not to allow me to do anything for Lily? inquired Miss Winton. Well, there's something you can do this minute if you'd like, said Mickey. I was going to hurry up and see my sunshine nurse, but it's a long way to the new hospital. And you could do as well if you would. Mickey, I'd love to. What is it? And may I see your family? You know I haven't had a peep yet. Well, soon now you may, said Mickey. You see, I ain't quite ready. Mickey, what do you know about the new Elizabeth home? asked Douglas. Only that a rich lady gave her house and money, and that my sunshine nurse is going to be there after this. I was going for my first trip tonight. I wondered, said Douglas. Mickey, when you get there, you'll find you've been there before. My eyes cried Mickey. Fact, Mr. Minturn did put his foot down and took his boys, began Douglas. Yes, he was telling me this morning, interrupted Mickey. That's what I get for stopping at the first page. And if I'd a look inside, bet I'd have known that long ago. He was telling you? queried Douglas. Yes, I guess I must kind of shied at him till he noticed it. I didn't know I did, but he caught me and told me his troubles by force. We shook hands to quit on. Say, he's just fine when you know him. And there doesn't seem to be a thing on earth he wouldn't do for you, Miss Leslie. Why, he said if he ever found happiness again, and his home became what it should, it would be because you were sorry for him and fixed things. Mickey, did he really rejoice the girl? Douglas, when may Mickey show me what he wants me to do? Right now, he answered. I got a load of books while he was away yesterday, and I haven't started them yet. Now is the best time. When Mickey made a leap from the trolley platform that night at what he already had named Cold Cream Junction, he was almost buried under boxes. He stepped high and prideful, 
for he had collected the money from his paper route and immediately spent some of it under Leslie Winton's supervision. Pillow bolstered on the front porch. On his comfort lay the tiny girl he loved. Mickey stopped and made a detailed inspection. He opened his lips and closed them for the lack of the right word. While he slowly and smilingly shook his head, Peaches leaned forward and reached toward him. Her greeting was indescribably sweet. Mickey dropped the bundles and went into her arms. Even in his joy he noted a new strength in their grip on him, an unusual clinging. He drew back half alarmed. You been a good girl, he queried suspiciously. Just as good, asserted Peaches. He didn't go and say any. Not ever, Mickey love us, not one, she cried. I ain't even thinked one. That will help, Peter says so. You've been washed and fed and everything all right, he proceeded. Just as right, she insisted. You like the nice lady, he went on. Just love the nice lady and Mary and Bobby and Peter and Junior. Just love all of them, she affirmed. Well, I hope I don't bust, he said. I never was so glad as I am that everything is good for you. These two things that ain't good. Well, if things ain't right here, with what everybody's doin' for you, they ought to be, cried Mickey. You cut complainin' right out, Miss Chicken. You forgot to set my lesson, and I ain't had my poetry piece for two days. That ain't complainin'. No taint, honey, conceded Mickey regretfully. No taint. That's just all right. I thought you were going to start kicking, and I wasn't going to stand for it. Course I'll set your lesson, course I'll make up your piece, but you must give me a little time. I was talking with Mr. Chuffner of the Herald, our paper, you know, and he's beginning to get in a hurry about his piece, too. I want mine first, demanded Peaches. Sure, you'll get it first, always, and I'm going to do something for you before I make it, cause I won't know how it goes till afterward, see? What you gonna do? she questioned. What's all the bundles? My, they look excitements. And so they are, triumphed Mickey. Where are all the folks? Do they leave you alone like this? No, they don't leave me alone only when I'm asleep in the room, said Peaches. They saw you coming and went away, cause they know families like to be alone sometimes. Ain't they smart to know that? They are, said Mickey. First you come to your bed a little while. I got something for you. Oh, Mickey, those bundles just look... Now you hold on, ordered Mickey. You wait and see, miss. Mickey carried her in and gently laid her down. Then he returned for the boxes. He opened one and from it selected a pair of pink stockings and slipped them on peaches. Then tiny soft buckskin moccasins embroidered and tied with ribbons to match the hose. Peaches squealed and clapped her hands over her mouth to muffle the sound. But Mrs. Harding heard and came to the door. Mickey asked for help. Young ladies who are going automobiling and taking walks are well enough to have dresses and things that all good girls have, he announced. But I'm a little dubious about how th these things go. Will you dress her? Yes, said Mrs. Harding. You fill the water bucket and the wood box and start the fire for supper. Mrs. Harding looked over the contents of the box and from plain soft pieces of underwear chose a gauze skirt, a dainty combination suit, and a tucked and trimmed petticoat, while Peaches laughed and sobbed for pure joy. Then Mickey came and Mrs. Harding went away. After various trials he decided on a white dress with pink ribbons, run in the neck, sleeves, and belt, slipping it on her and carefully fastening it. Mickey, I want the glass, she begged. Please, oh please, hurry, Mickey. Now you just wait, Miss Chicken, said Mickey. Then he brushed her hair and put on a new pink ribbon, not so large as those she had, but much more becoming. He laid a soft, warm little gray sweater with white collar and cuffs in reach, and in turning it she discovered a handkerchief and a pair of gloves in one pocket. Immediately she searched the other and produced a purse with five pennies in it. Then for no reason at all Peaches began to cry. "'Well, Miss Chicken!' exclaimed Mickey in surprise. "'I thought you'd be pleased!' Pleased, sobbed Mickey. Pleased, Mickey. I'm damn. I'm busted. Oh well then, go on and cry if you want to. Agreed, Mickey. But you'd look much nicer to show Mrs. Harding and Peter if you wouldn't. 
Peaches immediately wiped her eyes. Mickey lifted her and carried her back to the porch, placing her in a pillow-piled big chair. Then he put the gloves on her hands, set a hat on her head, and tied the pink ribbons under her chin. Peaches both laughed and cried at that, while the Harding family came in because they could not wait. Mickey raised and put in Peaches' shaking fingers the crowning glory of any small girl, a wonderful little pink parasol. Peaches appeared for a minute as if a faint were imminent. Now do you see why I wouldn't come with a poetry piece when my head was so full of these things? Yes, Mickey, but you will before night, she begged. You want it even now, he marveled. More in a parasol even, she declared. Well, you fool little sweet kid, cried Mickey, and choked. He fled around the house as Peter came out. In his ears as he went sounded Peter's big voice and the delighted cries of the family. I want Mickey, wailed Peaches. He heard her call and ran back fast for fear he might be so slow reaching her that Peter would serve. But to his joy he found that he alone would answer. I want to see me, demanded Peaches. Sure you do, cried Peter. I'll just hand down the big hall mirror so you can see all of you at once. He brought it and set it before her, and Peaches stared and drew back. She cried, Ah! Oh! in a harsh, half-scared voice. She gripped Mickey with one hand and the parasol with the other. She leaned and peeped and marveled, and smiled at a fully clothed little girl in the glass as the image smiled back. Peaches thought of letting go of Mickey to touch her hat and straighten her skirt, but felt so lost without him that she handed Peter the parasol and used that hand while the other clung to her refuge. When Mickey saw the treasure go in his favor, he swallowed lumps of emotion so big that the Hardings could see them running down his throat. Peaches, intent on the glass, smiled, grimaced, tilted her head, and finally began flirting outrageously with herself until all of them laughed and recalled her. She looked at Peter, smiled her most winsome smile, and exclaimed, Well, ain't I the... Now you go easy, Miss Chicken, warned Mickey. Mickey, if you hadn't stopped me, I'd have done it sure, sobbed P Peaches, collapsing against him. If I had, would you a took these beautiful things away from me? No, I wouldn't, said Mickey. I couldn't to save me, but I should. Mickey, I'm so tired, she said. Take my hat and put it where I can see it, and my pasol. And my coat? Gee, I don't have to be wrapped in sheets no more. And lay me down. Quick, Mickey, I'm sick-like. Well, I ought to had sense not to spring so much all at once, said Mickey, but it all seemed to belong. Sure I will, you poor kid. And Mickey, you won't forget the lesson in the poetry piece, she panted. No, I won't forget, promised Mickey, as he stretched her among her treasures and watched her fall asleep even while he slipped the gloves from her fingers. Next morning she found the lesson and the poetry piece on her slate. Mrs. Harding bathed and clothed her in the little garments and showed her enough more for the changes she would need, even two finer dresses for Sunday. She left the coat, hat, and parasol in reach. Then Peaches resolutely took up her pencil and set herself to copy the lines without knowing enough of the words to really understand. But she was extremely well acquainted with one word that Mickey had said just flew out of his mouth when he looked at her. And in her supreme satisfaction over her new possessions, she was sure the lines must be concerning them. Most of all, she was delighted with her slippers. A hundred times that morning she looked down, wiggled her toes, and moved her feet to see them better, and each time her joy in having her feet shod for walking intoxicated her. Between whiles she copied over and over, Lily, Miss L. P. O'Halloran daily went walking, in slippers so nifty the neighbors were talking. The minute she raised her gay pink parasol, the old red cow began to friskily bawl. When they observed the neat coat on her back, all the guineas in the orchard cried rack pot rack she was so lovely a bird flying her way sang sweet 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 all the rest of the day peter came in to visit a few times and she gave him the slate to see if he could read her copy and by this ruse she found what the lines were 
She was so overjoyed she opened her lips and then clapped both hands over them to smother the ejaculation on her tongue's end. To distract Peter, she stuck out her foot and moved it for him to see. "'Ain't they pretty and just as soft and fine?' she asked. "'Yes,' said Peter. "'They remind me of a flower called a lady slipper that grow along the edge of the woods. "'It's that shape, and the prettiest gold-yellow, but little. "'They'd about fit your doll. "'Oh, Peter, could you get me one? I want to see.' "'Why, I would, but they're all gone now, honey,' answered Peter. "'Next year I'll remember and bring you some when they bloom, "'but it's likely by that time you can go yourself and see them.' "'Do you honest think it, Peter?' asked Peaches, leaning forward eagerly. "'Yes, I honest think it,' repeated Peter emphatically. "'But I won't be here then,' Peaches reminded him. "'Well, it won't be my fault if you're not,' said Peter. End of chapter 16